And then next week, I think, and he had mentioned this to me, I, I, I knew about it, but I wasn't thinking about the dates. We have the UAP hearings coming up next week. Look at, see, uh, see the eyeballs. I, I'm not, I'm, I don't know. Well, Jared, do you have any thoughts on it? Or? Well, they're, they're not going to reveal anything. Uh, everything I've seen of the two uh, DOD officials that are going to be doing the report on AOSMIG or whatever the convoluted acronym is, their, their sole purpose is to maintain the secrecy around it. Um, for reasons I already produced earlier, like you, you cannot even reveal the existence of the technology without fear of it being reproduced, without fear of the international relations disasters from saying that you may or may not have been putting people in danger just by flying this craft over them. Well, yeah, I mean, it, you're talking about the TR-3B, but I mean, with, the, all, with all of it, all of the craft saying that they know, have known that there has been this threat. They, they've known about human mutilations. They've known about, you know, abduction. They've known about all these, these things and they've been downplaying it as, oh, but don't worry about it. This, this isn't a big deal. It, it, the amount of intelligence disaster and egg on their face would be so bad. Um, I think that's the big reason why Lou well, then they one, should one of like the people include you in to combat it. I mean, think about it. If it's such a bad thing for humanity and the ecosystem and the planet, then, you know, if you were one of the ones that were able to detect it and question it and, you know, do your research in this, you know, the alternative, it's not like shutting you down. It's like, well, you know what? Join the loop because, you know, our purpose is to protect our planet. So, you know, we need your help. Yeah. Since you know so much. I mean, I mean we're you know, I mean, that's the logic thing would be. I mean, why would it be secret otherwise? We're, you know we're in an era of change, so it's possible. You know, there, it's I guess all things are possible, right? Electric vehicles, I think, are a great example of that. But, you know, but but I, I kind of understand what Jared is saying. And I, I there's also this idea of, I, I mean, you know, the, the Department of Defense, what is their job? Their job is to protect us, right? I'm sure it's not easy for the DOD to come forward and say, oh, by the way, you know, so the, these things are flying around with impunity and there's not a darn thing we can do to stop it, you know? Um, or there is a thing that we can do to stop it. And we have been engaging with them behind everybody's back for a very long time. I, the, the number of crazy avenues you can take, I strongly suspect the reason why Lou Elizondo is one of the proponents for the forgiveness aspect of the whole thing to, to say, okay, we're not going to press charges against any um, officials or any um, private sectors or, or anybody for, for their part in this play is because, for example, Lockheed Martin is responsible for 1% of the stock market, right? If just they got in trouble, that's going to crash the world economy, not to mention the DOD is responsible for 50 cents out of every tax dollar, which means all of a sudden our entire tax system goes to underwater too. Like it, the, the repercussions and the ripple effect from a, a hard disclosure would be potentially very, very disastrous for many areas, even though it would be amazing for humanity uh, in the long term. Yeah, well, and that's that's a good point. I mean, you know, it, it would be it would be intriguing. and. Who knows? I mean, maybe, you know, maybe these officials will will kind of loosen things up enough or or even just reinforce, because when you look at the report last year, right, that what they really said was, I mean, that my interpretation of it, because you could go different ways, but my interpretation was they were saying, OK, UFOs are real. We can't really, you know, there's there's not much we can do about it. And, you know, they're, they're violating our airspace and it's a traffic, you know, it's an air air traffic safety issue. So. You know, even if they come forward and reinforce that for the media, I, I think, and and maybe this is that you know the the what they called it the white unicorn the the disclosure process. Maybe this is a, a very slow, gentle disclosure process where somebody's saying, okay, you know, let's let's just let this thing out so slow that people can get used to it. And nobody freaks out. But um, but I think knowing that it's possible makes it feasible. You know. I mean, Arthur C. Clarke said that, actually. He said, I, I was, this this was way, way back, but he did a presentation on gravity modification in the 50s, and it wasn't very useful, but um, he said, anything mankind wants badly enough, it usually gets, you know, and, and um, 
you know, knowing that it's possible, I think makes it feasible because you're like, okay, somebody else did it. So how can we do it as opposed to, can it be done? You know? Also the APEC conferences along with the MUFON conference and, and all the things where the conversation is getting louder and, and more complex and more is being revealed by the general civilian community. I think that's helping to put more pressure. The more that we can do as individual independent researchers to try to reveal, hey, look, here's an, a piece of evidence or a piece of example that this is the exact spot that you officials need to go look at and go talk to because this is the group that has what you're talking about them having rather than asking the DOD officials who are at least at best uh, conflicted about how much and what to reveal. I'm, just looking at, I'm looking at the chat here also. Harold was asking about the, yeah, uh, yeah. let me see, three. Yes. Do we have a squadron of the RTB? How many? And uh, if we do, I mean, what are they using it for? I mean, uh, what is the speculation that everything up there? Because I know there's a lot of speculation up there. Like for example, sometimes it's information like Jared showed the aircraft carrier with a three RTB, which is fake. So what basically is going on that it is known about speculation, squadron, whatever. What military power role are they playing right now? So it depends on how deep down the rabbit hole you go and what you're willing to believe and what you're not willing to believe. Um, according to Ed Fouché, they built three 200 foot prototypes and the active models were 600 foot on one side, which is ridiculously big. I don't see how they could land those even at S4 and not you know, get attention. Even if it's got active camo, there's gonna be folks with uh, infrared cameras or other ways that they're, such a large craft would be observed. Um, so they, they're supposed to operate very high in the atmosphere. Um, one aspect about them that I didn't mention earlier that I should have, the three lights that you see on the sides, right? Those, aren't, those are just uh, hydrogen oxygen thrusters. So when it reduces its mass, it's using those for attitude control and for ex some acceleration. Um, but as far as how many operational 600 foot craft models there are, I mean, it, it's really hard to tell because we don't have uh, good images of what's in orbit or just non-terrestrial altogether. If these things are going to the base on the dark side of the moon or the Mars base or other star systems, I mean, we, we, don't, we don't know what they're doing. Um, according to what I found, the claim was that they had enough oxygen on board for two days and that they could uh, drop down into the atmosphere to harvest more oxygen um, if needed. Although with sub submarine tech, you know, they have CO2 scrubbers, they could, they could remain indefinitely without having to gather more oxygen except for um, their thrusters. Um, one further comment on that though, uh, the, on September 10th, 2001, the day before 9-11, um, was it Rumsfeld? Whoever the DOD head guy was at the time, uh, he was before Congress or at some meeting at some podium um, and people were asking him, hey, uh, we got all these accounting errors with uh, DOD money. Um, we've given you guys, uh, you know, $5.2 trillion or whatever over the last however many decades. And of that, there's like two plus trillion dollars that we're not finding in the books. Uh, disclaimer on this is that, you know, $1 goes through a ton of buckets on its way to its final destination. And if it skips just one of those buckets, now you have an unaccounted for dollar, even though that dollar still ended up where it was supposed to be. According to Ed Touche, um, it was the SR-71, SR-94, um, the Aurora program uh, that the TR-3B program used to siphon funds from. So looking at how much money uh, went through the Aurora program is a good place to start, at least to figure out uh, how much each of the prototype crafts cost. You can figure out how much they cost, you can figure out how many they might've made. Um, that kind of falls in line with what Ed suggested. Uh, according to the documents, it suggests they were about $6 billion each for the prototypes, which is pocket change. I mean, one B-2 bomber is $1 billion. Um, this, in, in the grand scheme of DOD money, that's, that's not a lot. Um, for the 600-foot craft, though, uh, what I had heard, what I've read, is that they managed to make it more efficient. Uh, so they were able to produce those for not you know, a linear amount more, but just a little bit more, just like a, a billion or two billion more than that. Um, but still with the amount of money that uh, 
gets darkened by SAP, by black programs, uh, it's really hard to account. Final thing I'll say is that the Belgium incident of uh, 89 to 90, where there was all these reports of them flying around, um, it, it may be not just that there was a lot of them, but they're not all owned by US interests. If you wanna put on the woo hat real tight, um, it's possible there is an international cooperation around these craft, which just stretches the belief factor almost to its limit to say that there is multiple um, countries or many countries that have access or at least knowledge of these craft and haven't somehow leaked that yet. Like that, that's a big stretch, but based on the Belgium incident, it might make sense. Uh, S SDI um, partnered with Germany, um, I want to say in 87 or 88, um, to share a lot of their tech with them. So it, it's not outside the realm of possibility, it just stretches the belief factor. From an engineering perspective, uh, a triangle is the, the simplest, uh, what would you call it, non-deformable geometry. And, and so if you had something like the TR3B, the one, I guess one thing, and, and I, I've read this other places, but they've said one of the things that makes this obviously human made as opposed to a UAP is UAPs tend to be circular and organic, whereas the, the black triangle is, is a triangle. And, and if you had heavy... Uh, like what we learned earlier, like if it go, has enough energy circulating it, it's going to glow into an orb where you're going to see it as a well, or not a triangle anymore. <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. According to um, some of the other reports that I've seen, the uh, velocities that these things can achieve lets them, and the fact that they are space capable, uh, means that they can travel um, around the globe very, very quickly, as well as to the moon um, in a, a very short amount of time. If you have the technology to be able to have your craft be anywhere in the globe within a minute or a couple of minutes, um, that reduces the number of them that you need. For the Star Wars program, yes, they wanted to have the arrayed grid so that um, it was redundancy. If one laser goes offline, the other lasers can still shoot down uh, nukes as well as triangulate so they can have multiple lasers shooting down the same nukes at the same time. But with these crafts, you don't necessarily need as many because Imagine having a space-based laser satellite that has the ability to be anywhere around the globe in a minute. Um, that further uh, supports the idea for the secrecy of this, because if any country had the technology to drop a nuke from anywhere in the globe in a minute, I mean, game of war is, is a thing of the past. You can't, that, that tops it. That, there, it's checkmate. Isn't it like, per horizontal latitude that, you know, gases crystallize into matter. So you could have the possibility of, it starts off with one triangle, but it can duplicate across the temperature manifestation of matter, of, you know, existence of a layer of matter. But it's already like robotically coded to replicate itself and replicate. I mean, we've seen these things that start with one, become two, become three, become, you know, so the whole thing. The, so, the von Neumann probe aspects that you're talking about, where you have a probe that goes to a planet and then it's got like its own 3D printer and collect resources and print more and more of itself. That aspect yeah, for the UAP program planet. has been um, talked about a lot, but for the TR3Bs- Image of itself. Like, okay, think of this. If you were to engineer this thing into little triangles that stacked up in previous images, I've seen this and, and, you know, science has proved this, like at the end, you're going to have like one wedge sliver and that would be the core of that bit, of that sequence of that bit. You know, it's either going to be, you know, a positive or a negative. And like, yeah, the, you know, in, in this case, positive. though. Lulu, in, in in this case, I, I think you're talking about what like what could be possible, but oh, but no. um, the, okay, the... out of experience, I've seen this craft. I've seen it on something called the Wolf Moon. I believe it was in the year of nineteen or no, uh, twenty eighteen. You know, maybe 
2020, maybe. But something was called the Wolfman. And, you know, we were standing out there. And I saw this thing, you know, at that eclipse moment, hovering on top of our house. If anybody had seriously the capability of going back into geo and, you know, lunar eclipses of, you know, that title, you'll see on that map, there was a, you know, a triangular craft that was, you know, lining up with the lunar eclipse shadow. There's no way about it. I mean, I saw it. I was Lula, there. Lula, you know, I, I made. Wait, can I ask you a question about what you saw? Um, yes. You said it was hovering above your house. If you were to stick your arm straight out, right? About how big would you say this thing was? Was it like size of your thumbnail or like that big? Or uh, like let's say if there's a, a cloud layer, you know, just not not a thick one, but just you know. And maybe like, like, like something like, like, you know, I don't know. About, about the like size of a cookie? Yeah, I saw it. I saw it. Like, it, you know, it, and it didn't stand at our house. No, it wasn't following. It was just following a shadow line, you know, like of an eclipse. But I just, we just happened to, I, you know, made everyone make it as an event, you know, like, oh, let's go outside. It's called the wolf moon. You know, let's, let's look at the wolf moon. This is fun. You know, and I wore a wolf coat and, you know, I had everybody sit, and, you know, we sat next there and we're watching this thing. And yeah, it just, you know, wherever that alignment went, it just continued, you know? And so- Thank, thank you for sharing, Lulu. I, I yeah, apologize, no, I'm gonna have no to get going lies, here. Though. Yeah. There was no light. That's the only difference. And, you know, you really had to have a degree of, you know, colored spectrum. Like you could see between maybe a fraction of two colors to detect it. And, you know, I, I don't care. I'm like seriously an open book. Um, I had laser eye just as a correction at one point in my life. So I believe, you know, anything manufactured did not you know it's going to leave a a you know a difference especially if it's a machine that's how motherboards are created it's got to start with something or has the capability of controlling something either or you know and so when i even like in a, on a blue clear sky i could look straight and all of a sudden have what you call a tic tac appear and then it takes form as you know a plane and then it slows down. But if I were to take it as a, a you know, like a, a, a fast paced shadow, it's just, you know, normal, natural movement, I might even see a streak. It's just when I consciously look at it, it manifests into a, you know, uh, an understandable to human perspective, visual, what it could possibly be. You know, the saying goes, it's a bird, it's a plane, it's a this, it's a, oh, and then, you know, and then, or, oh, like, it just, it yeah. refines it to human visual. I think Josh was saying that your, your moon was on 2019. I think he was saying 2019 was the year that that happened. So, uh, my, my, so Michael had a, Michael wanted to go, go for it, sir. We're, we're an open discussion, so. Thank you. Um, let's see. So I had a few notes. Uh, very nice presentation, Jared. Uh, there were a few things uh, that I hope would uh, maybe elucidating. Uh, so for a lot of nuclear applications, uh, the Moss power effect is interesting. So um, like I've talked with Jeremy at, uh, occasionally, um, a lot of the low energy nuclear reaction stuff uh, may be related to um, what was a Peter Hagelstein's work at MIT. Uh, so there's another name for you to dig into with your research. Uh, I, by the way, very nice uh, cross-referencing the SDI with the uh, Google patents and uh, the public publications. That was, that's good. That's the way that it should be done when you're searching for this sort of stuff. Um, and, uh, but anyway, yeah. Um, so there's another name for you, the, uh, the Mossbauer effect and potentially inverse Mossbauer effect, 
are very useful for generating uh, other types of novel nuclear reactors like solid state fusion uh, via the scheme proposed by NASA recently with their, um, what was that paper? Um, I was just on the tip of my tongue. The one with the erbium deuteride, the lattice confinement fusion. Yeah. So if you have lattice confinement fusion with the with uh, moss bower materials added, which can uh, basically reflect around your gammas, or uh, they'll fluoresce in the gamma spectrum. It keeps your gammas around, so they. It's kind of like analogous to slowing down neutrons with heavy water. But anyway, um, point being, point being, there's a number of schemes uh, for uh, a neutronic fusion in those materials that are promising and should, should be looked into more. Um, so in terms of power, uh, that's a possibility. And then, um, you mentioned, um, quasi particles and materials. That's, that's a good start. Um, recently I've been looking at, uh, polarons and bipolarons in, uh, uh, in materials that have strong uh, electron phonon coupling. So they're not quite polaritons. Um, and because you don't have an actual excitation or an exciton, uh, they tend to have fermionic character instead of bosonic character, which is very interesting because in principle, you could amplify Cooper pairing using uh, polarons instead of polaritons. Uh, and the other interesting thing is there's a number of mercury alloys mixed with ammonia, uh, magnesium, bismuth, other, like you can mix a whole bunch of different metals to get alloys at room temperature that are liquid. And potentially if you have mer mercury ammonia solutions, you can get very cold temperatures. So something that like everyone's like, oh, it needs to be mercury or something for the TR3B. Well, maybe it's a mercury alloy with those materials. And if you have a eutectic mixture, you have layered structure, which may allow for uh, type two superconductivity uh, despite the liquid uh, nature of the thing, which normally normally you need a layered structure in order to get type two superconductivity. So um, so let me see if I can kind of um, parse this out because that, that's a couple of different things to address. Uh, yeah. regarding, regarding the Moss Bauer effect, um, I did kind of start looking into that one um, however, if you're having a lattice structure, then that means that you're going to have to have energy densities uh, that are not going to destroy the lattice, which is why it's been so difficult for fusion. This is my understanding of it. Don't quote me on it. Um, but it's been my understanding. The reason why fusion with the Moss Bauer effect is so difficult is because uh, as soon as you start achieving fusion, you're destroying the thing that's allowing it to occur. Um, that may be a solved problem already, especially with the super resources they have available, but I'm, I'm not well-versed enough. In so the you're, you're, you're okay as long as the, the bulk material is solid. Once you pass the melting point, you no longer have the standard Mossbauer effect. Uh, so as long what as- about, you, What about cold fusion? Same deal. Well, so actually yeah, cold fusion, uh, there's a whole bunch of other quasi particles which can be involved. I think the most practical is this Moss Bauer effect driven thing, but um, there's another a number of other quasi particles which are lattice dependent. The Moss Bauer effect is not lattice dependent. As long as you're in the solid state, your material can be fully metamixed and it will still. Um, so, have you guys seen the, the video called Rubber Duck? It's a UAP called Rubber Duck. Well, before we go on that, um... well, the reason I'm bringing it up is because it's uh, if you look at this uh, UAP on the infrared, it's cold. It's not hot, and it's not cold like an ice cube. It, it's sustained cold. I mean, wasn't that just because they flipped like black to hot on the video? No, it stays, it's, it, it says black hot on the video, but it's white. That's the point. That's how you know it's cold. Oh, okay. Well, um, so because, it, it, because it, if it was a, it, like, for example, the Tic Tac was hot. 
Well, I would refer you to Remy Cornwall and Dan Sheehan's research with uh, basically heat recycling. Um, well, all the, it's like, all, all the, cold. the cold fusion is basically the idea is that uh, it's a change of state, but where where in this change when it's changing state, it's kind of like when uh, like you go from liquid water to ice there's an actual temp drop that occurs that time dilation so it's kind of like always when you fuse fusion doesn't always create heat is my point sometimes it can create cold so if there is one thing that i can add to that michael and then i'll go back to your question or, or mr boyd versus michael um okay. the cold i have one more i have one more uh comment after uh, All right. your response. Okay. So uh, the cold fusion aspect, I just started getting into that regarding SDI a few days ago. Um, fascinating stuff on that front. In the early 90s, when the cold fusion war was really getting hot, right? Um, there was a few scientists that were losing a lot of face because the scientific community was actively like suppressing anything cold fusion, right? So uh, forgive me, I can't remember if it was Schwinger or if it was um, Winterberg. Uh, but one of the two, they lost a ton of credibility. They were willing to put their, their whole amazing careers on the line, trying to support the work of um, the, the cold fusion scientists. And they, they lost all their cred. They, they lost their positions in, in very high uh, ranking scientific institutions. Um, it was a massive blow. I want to say Ed Teller uh, eventually spoke about it later in the 90s saying that what had occurred with the cold fusion suppression was a travesty because that was one of the texts from SDI that they had been researching that was supposed to start gaining some public um, appreciation and instead the opposite occurred. Mm -hmm. What, it, what yeah. if the three yeah. points are built on like the three primary elements for you know creation? Oh, real real fast, Lulu, I, I was yeah, gonna go back uh, to Michael's yeah, Mike. question. Yeah, go right. back so, to Mike. Uh, so the other, the last uh, thing I wanted to mention is uh, to hopefully to further elucidate what Pice was saying. Um, it, the uh, he's using vibrations of matter along with electric electromagnetic fields because the he's using the mass energy of the matter itself to try and break the Schwinger limit. So if you if you vibrate mass fast enough, in principle. Um, you'd break the Schwinger limit. In fact, the experiment that they did to prove that the Schwinger limit could be broken was in a particle accelerator using two um, protons or something that came with a, within, within a near miss of each other. And then the virtual fields of those two uh, mass, like massive particles, was, that was sufficient to break the Schwinger limit on top mm -hmm. of the large like relativistic speeds and everything else. That was so, what I saw from Daniel Brandenburg's yeah. talk. Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, the energy of the electromagnetic stuff going on and the vibrations going on can be relatively low if the, if you're uh, making up the difference with the, just the mass energy of the matter that you're working with in some way. That um, was part of the reason why I was getting into the Dubai frequencies of what they were dealing with. So those high energy densities from the surface acoustic waves, the, the squishing and stretching of the plasma field or whatever medium they're using, um, they can get extremely high frequencies, uh, which translates to extremely high energy densities just through these phononic vibrations, right? Of, of if you're, that's that's uh, extremely high energy densities localized to the moving the accelerating nucleons of the matter is that's a caveat that is maybe useful but yeah, yeah um, that's basically it and uh, I mean I'm I also am skeptical uh, for now but uh, it's an interesting idea. <laughs>